Hello world, thank you very much for joining this live session. My name is Dr. Kulmeet Kunlis, and today's live session is dedicated to frequently asked questions about hypertension. And I have decided to break this uh, live session into a couple of parts. The first part will be we will discuss about what hypertension is, what are the things which are happening in your body, then why having a adequate or normal blood pressure is important. And then we will go over what are the complications when the blood pressure is high or low. Then we'll talk about what we could do to keep it under control. So the first and the foremost thing is, let's first understand what is hypertension. And the most beautiful thing here is that uh, just regard your circulatory system or cardiovascular system as a plumbing of your house. So if you look at it, that if you look at the, take this analogy of a house, you have a pump outside which pumps and create a pressure and to push it through all the different channels. And then the, your water flows through your channels or pipes and then you have taps. Each, your bathroom has a tap, your kitchen has a tap, and then you it, you have upstairs, downstairs, you have a multiple taps, multiple showers, multiple places, this one is. So regard this circulatory system, heart as the pump through which generates all this force to circulate the blood volume, and then all the arteries which take the blood from your heart to your uh, brain and uh, different parts of your body, whether it's kidney, lungs, or um, GI tract, muscle, take it as the arteries, which like take the blood from heart or the pump to different parts of the body. And then from there, the blood has to come back through your veins and the arteries and vein like make a meshwork of this capillaries, which is very extensive network all over your, uh, the, all over the body. And then the blood moves back into our heart from where it gets pumped into our lungs and it gets purified and the circle keeps on going. So if we take this analogy of a pump, your pipes, then your sewer system, which takes it back. And then in between <clears throat> we, this, different controls, the tabs, showers, different organs controlling it. So what this means is like a heart generates the force to move this uh, this flow. Then your pipes are the one which are taking the blood from the heart to different one. Then your sewer is taking it back. Then bring it back to your purification center, which is the right side of the heart. And then from there, it gets pumped back into your... Uh, into your lungs and then it gets purified the circle keeps on going so let's take heart first which is the pump this is the main force generator this one is so as you know the pump when it pushes the blood uh, the, the, uh, the pump pushes the water through this thing and then the size of your pipe determines how much flow can happen if the size is small there will be extra more pressure because of the, the, the laws of physics and the volume of the blood which will be flowing through that pipe will be very low. So the first thing is the pump, how much force is generating, then the size of the pump is the, um, is important. Then the third which this thing is a different taps and showers heads and this thing. The same way you could replace these tap showers with your different organ, whether it's your eyes, your kidneys, your GI, heart itself, your muscles, those are the taps. And then coming back through the sewer system or through our veins, become bringing it back. So the key component which I want to say is that in this circulatory system, you have to look at when you're talking about any disease in cardiovascular system, but particularly in relation to hypertension, you need to look at in terms of pump, channels, then the channels bring it back, then is the how much water is this, how, how much water is of, um, flowing through those pipes. And then this body in which we live in, it is the most sophisticated machine which is created. 
then it depends on how much each organ need this blood supply remember we have the analogy we have tap we could increase the flow decrease the flow the same way the body each organ system regulates how much blood it allows to get it into but that's what we call auto regulation plus these to keep this pump blood vessels and multiple channels working we have our body has created two three kind of sensors in our body those are first is we call baroreceptors baroreceptors are the one which is like the how much the pressure under which pressure your blood is flowing through your blood vessels and the most important the baroreceptors into the carotid artery bulbs that's where we uh, the carotid arteries those where we how much flow of uh, or the under pressure the blood is being pumped up that is what determines what this uh, uh the, the, that's the function of the baroreceptor is check, checking the or sensitive to the pressure second is the we call is the chemoreceptors there is like how much the chemical flow and all those things they are there are chemical receptors and then third is the volume how much volume which is flowing and your kidneys are the one which are very sensitive they are your chemical the your volume center so as i said the blood pressure the auto regulation of blood pressure is at the level of organ but as a system it is controlled by how much barrier baroreceptors chemoreceptors and the how much volume of blood which is circulating so once you put this and there is a constant feedback from all this from your heart arteries capillaries veins and then through the baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and the volume and stretch receptors, this whole cascade is then is being regulated through our autonomic nervous system and a lot of hormones which are being produced in this system. What happens is they, if the blood pressure goes down, then our sympathetic system gets over it, the heart rate increases, your heart beats fast, and then your, then your blood pressure comes up so that each organ is given enough blood supply. If your blood pressure is high, your parasympathetic system gets activated, your heart rate will go down, your stroke, the force with which your heart is pumping, that will decrease, and then that will help to bring your blood pressure down. If the volume is down, your kidneys start retaining salt and water, and, and then your blood volume increases and your blood pressure will come in. So if you look at it, this one is it's a very intricate process of trying to simplify the goal of this video is to ensure that we understand what this blood pressure is and how this works. It is not a complete, true 100% representation of the way I'm trying to explain it to you. But my goal here is that through this video, you should be able to have a concept of pump, blood vessel, blood volume, and your other hormones and also the different kind of neurochemical transmitters uh, and the sympathetic and parasympathetic, how they come into play. So now let's put this thing together. So the control or the control of blood pressure together, it depends on following. Number one, your heart, which is your pump, your channel, what is the size, whether the size of the, your channels are big or small. Number three, is how much blood is flowing through that. Number four is the status of your sympathetic system. Four, next, fifth is the uh, your parasympathetic system. Then is your volume through the kidneys. So once we have put in this thing together, that creates a very beautiful intricate system and a body controls this part, your blood pressure, so that each organ gets enough blood and they are adequately perfused and there is no, no organ is starved. So now what happened is, what is then happen? I think the next discussion at this point we should start is, what is hypertension? I think before we talk about hypertension, let's talk about what is a normal blood pressure is and why it's needed. Normal blood pressure so far, I think intuitively you could reduce is, is the force which is needed each organ to get enough blood supply and each organ 
regulates at this level through the analogy which I give you faster showers. Each car regulates this one part. But there got to be basic supply of force before this auto regulation kicks in. So blood pressure's main function is to provide essential life sustaining nutrition and sustaining clearance through these uh, through different mechanisms to each organ. The force at which or the blood pressure at which our system works perfect is uh, blood pressure of 120, around 120 systolic and 80 diastolic. Let's talk about what is systolic blood pressure and what is diastolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure, when your heart is squeezing, at the maximum squeeze, it milks out all the blood out of your system. That is the systolic blood pressure. Then the blood is flowing through your channels and the heart is relaxing. And then when the heart is relaxing, the blood pressure in your channels or the arteries at the time when the heart is relaxing is your diastolic. So basically, systolic blood pressure is at the maximum squeeze and the diastolic is when your heart is relaxing. So what it does is, so the heart blood pressure has a two kind of uh, measure, the upper number, which we call systolic and the diastolic. And then why they are important. Why diastolic blood pressure is important is, or systolic blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is very easy to understand because it's the kick or the force with which the heart is being pumped through your blood vessels. But what happens is in the, in the diastolic blood pressure is heart muscle is relaxing. So now let's understand what we call hypertension. If we will go through the reasons of hypertension when, in a couple of minutes, but just uh, follow me that you have a high blood pressure. So rather than having your blood pressure 120, now your blood pressure is 140 or 130. Your upper or systolic number is high. We call it systolic hypertension. Or if your diastolic blood pressure is high, we call it diastolic hypertension. What that means? See, the, when the blood pressure goes up, this means your blood vessels are being bombarded with more shearing force. The blood is flowing through your blood vessel. They create, that creates a shearing force. And that shearing force is, uh, is the one which is going and tearing or the inner lining of your blood vessel that's getting hammered all the time. And that leads to all the complications which blood pressure does, which we will discuss. So regard that this one is when your blood pressure is going up, the shearing force, the which with the blood is flowing through your blood vessels, especially in the angles where the, your blood vessels are dividing, those angles are bombarded with a higher shearing force, this one is. So then we talk about, that's what this hypertension does, it, that it's uh, creating shearing force into your blood vessels. Now let's further talk about what are the stages of hypertension. It is like, uh, it depends on how high your blood pressure is. So first thing is the blood pressure, if we categorically, there are two major organizations which kind of uh, help us to produce evidence-based guidelines, what needs to be done in our community, what are the things, what medications work, and then in the special circumstances based on race, age, gender, what works. So that community is called uh, GNC, and the last time, the last guidelines came in through GNC-8. Then American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, they also come up with evidence-based evidence -based guidelines all the time. But these two organizations, GNC and the American Heart Association and American Cardiology, and Cardiology have a lot to do with reviewing the evidence, then coming up with evidence-based guidelines and the treatment guidelines and the target goal for the blood pressure, what needs to be done. Let's talk about now what are the stages are. If your upper number, we have to follow both upper and lower number going on this one is. But I will divide this thing easily because when we are trying to remember too many things in medicine, 
it becomes very complicated. Let's first agree the ideal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Then anybody who has blood pressure which is more than 130, with 130 upper number and lower number less than 89, we call stage one guideline. So basically happening is 10 degree up from 120 and then nine millimeters of mercury up on the diastolic blood pressure. That's your stage of one hypertension. Then if once it's moved from 131 to 140, and then the lower one from it more than 90, we call it systolic, uh, we call it diastolic stage two hypertension. So basically what I want you to remember is ideal blood pressure 120, less than 120 over 80, but based on all the guidelines, the, this thing is, remember the blood number 140 over 90. If you have hypertension and you're being treated or unless there are certain circumstances, special circumstances, which I will go over in a minute, you're, you are trying to keep your blood pressure less than 140 over 90 all the time. Because this is a very common question, which I talk to my patients every day is, what is our treatment goal? When we're treating blood pressure, what is our treatment goal is? So the what happens is, uh, if not, Ideal, as I said, is one to less than 120 over 80, but there is a margin of error between the 20 points up from 120 to 140, and then from 80 to 90. There is, if ideal is hard to maintain and hard to accomplish, so based on the evidence, according to GNC 8 guidelines, that the blood pressure, if we treating blood pressure, and for all of us to know is that we want to keep our blood pressure less than 140 over 90. Because why is this number? Because they have found in all research that if we keep our blood pressure less than 140 over 90, your body is not at more extra risk to develop where complications from from elevated blood pressure. Because what many are treating blood pressure is, uh, when we do the blood pressure medications, you need to understand, then we once we give medications, those medications have side effects, they have a cost, and they do not only do what we want them to do, they do all other things in the body. So basically what we are trying to do is, you are trying to benefit the risk and benefit. How we treat blood pressure, we are gonna go over, but when we are treating either with lifestyle or with medication, your one number you, I want you to remember is 140 and 90. And then we want to shoot for less than 140 or 90. According to GNC 8, if you are 80 year old, so that now this is the specific guidelines which we are getting into. When we are like specific recommendation for each of you, Look at your age. If you are more than 60 year old or if you are less than 60 year old, the guidelines are if you are more than 60 year of age, your target goal is blood pressure is less than 140 over 90. Why is that? Because after this age, as per guidelines, GNC 8, the risk when we use more and more medication to bring your blood pressure down, you have a high risk of complications you do get into side effects and then the risk of falls and complication increase. So we are shooting for one fall. Then if you are less than, your age is less than 60, because remember, if you're less than 60, this means you have a lot, lot of lifespan left and that will lead to, or that will, that with time has a lot to do with adversely affecting your body. So if you're less than 60, that's one. Number two, if you're a diabetic. Number two. Number three, if you have already heart attack and stroke and you're less than 60, our target we are trying to reach is 130 over 80. So if now, so far from our discussion, there are three numbers which are I want you to 
leave this if there is some take home point first point is that the ideal is less than 120 over 80 second based on your age if you are more than 60 your target goal is to keep less than 140 over 90 but if you are less than 60 or or plus if you're diabetic or you already have a heart attack and stroke or heart failure then the goal is 130 over 80. that way you will understand the, like uh, how this blood pressure works out now how do we diagnose what are the symptoms of hypertension that's where the magic comes in that's why it's the biggest problem with hypertension is there is no one specific symptoms which we could attribute that if you have a high blood pressure and uh, you will have high blood pressure, uh, the, you will have this symptom. Unfortunately, there is no specific symptom unless it's terribly high and then those few symptoms can happen. So that's why it is like uh, you have to be sure like home. You need to check your blood pressure to know that. Easiest that's rule of thumb which I teach my patients every week is or in every day is if your waist size, if you're a male, if your waist size is more than 38, and if you are a lady and your waist size is more than 36, you are at high risk to develop high blood pressure. So monitor your blood pressure at home. But in general, there is no specific symptom which it can be attributed only to hypertension. But there are some common things, like we, we know that which first hint I look, gave you, I just look at yourself, and if you're with, you know you are overweight and your waist is high, you are at a high risk for this thing. But in more 90% of the physicians will agree with me is that we find hypertension most of the time the patients is when they come to us for regular physicals. They have some problem, they come to us, their blood pressure is high, and then this, that's the first time they are being told that their blood pressure is high. So that's why we every insurance curve wants you to have a annual physical because they know that if you go to physician regularly, we will be able to diagnose those, we will be able to find and diagnose and treat you so that you don't develop all those complications. And that is very important that you, you follow up with your physicians regularly and you get annual physical and then there got to be a lot of awareness. First is the personal awareness, which I'm trying to do it through these videos. Then the communities, our churches, and then there should be some public health policies which, which will require that we should be able to do the blood pressures. These days, the blood pressure monitors are getting very smart. There is nobody, most of us have now smartphones and the newer blood pressure machines are very intuitive like they will take your blood pressure and they will automatically put up into your in your phone and you record it and if you are taking your blood pressure over the period of time they will create a pattern and that you could take it to your physician and that helps us a lot because what happens is once you come to our office and you you come to office probably after five years and you have any other medical problem, whether you're in pain or any other problem that that's not your normal baseline status, then what we have is we don't know whether it's a true blood pressure or it's a reaction to what is going on. So most of the time, me and my colleagues will uh, will tell you that your blood pressure is high and we want you to monitor at home. And then when you come back, we will check your blood pressure. Uh, we'll check it and if it's a consistently high, we start the treatment. So I think the message here is, if your disposable income allows, we should have a good quality blood pressure machines. And uh, the one which basically eliminates the margin of error. There are a lot of good blood pressure machines that are available, which are automated. And uh, you take it, they will, and they come with the, actually the guidelines. The one which I bought recently was from Withering, and it comes with the, with the full uh, blood pressure cough where uh, you don't have to do anything. You keep your hand at the heart level, and then it takes three readings, and each every three minutes apart, 
<coughs> what it does it it removes all the anxieties confabulations and personal error how to do it when to do that and i was amazed how intuitive it was <coughs> every time i try to lower my hand and from heart level it will tell me that the, your arm is not at the right level so basically these machines are eliminating the repeatedly the errors which we could have because one of the biggest question i used to get it is okay doctor i have a blood pressure machine how do i check it and the previous machines were cumbersome but these new machines a they are very cheap now number 2 they are very intuitive and then artificial intelligence in them is very smart and it is helping us to control to a to take the blood pressure properly and then also you don't have to write it it automatically goes in your app and then you could create patterns i think that is a very handy tool and i was very happy with my blood pressure cough because i was able to take it to my own physician and show them over the period of time that my where my blood pressure reading was and what kind of treatment if i needed they will be able to deduce and take care of themselves so that is how we diagnose the diagnose the blood pressure is that a it doesn't have much symptoms b it is easy to diagnose but you have to suspect it you have to monitor it and you have to go for regular physicals yeah, so that you are monitored now there is a lot of awareness at work like a lot of businesses offer health screening seminars health fairs and all those things and at shield medical group we participate in all community resources wherever we can we want to be part of solution and uh, if we will check your blood pressures and then other thing which i have seen which is very good is if you go to walmart publix they have free machines those machines may not be 100% accurate but they are very sensitive sensitive means is those machines overread it but if your blood pressure is normal in those machines you could bet your blood pressure is normal but if that blood pressure is high there then you should get your physician to check it or home monitor yourself so that you could take care of that part so we so far we covered but this one is the analogy of the plumbing system then we talked about the how the symptoms then the how we diagnose it uh, then we talked about the devices which are available uh, which will help now let's talk about treatment and that's where i want to kind of develop or spend a lot of time try to understand how this because it is a preventable disease i in my opinion and in my experience dictates is that if you are honest i tell this thing in my videos is that we don't want any complications or we don't want any disease but at the same time we do not want to change that will not happen it's uh, as i think i'm growing in medicine and i'm learning we all will go through pain and pain means that either if we don't we have a bad lifestyle we will go through pain through developing some disease or we have to change ourselves and go through pain of self discipline so we are not getting out of pain either through self discipline or through disease and i rather be disciplined live quality for long life rather than spending my, my hard and money and uh, health on things which are preventable i created a video recently that how to lower your blood pressure by 30 points in one month in one week and i want to elaborate that part because we got a lot of comments on that video and i want to take this opportunity to explain you in in a longer and bigger detail so that you see how this thing is if you research all hypertension literature where people get as a population first let's understand how big the problem is 47% of united states population have blood pressure more than 120 over 80 meaning whether it's a stage 1 hypertension stage 2 hypertension or stage 3 hypertension but the point here is it is high 
so half of us which are uh, in just look around at your house half of us will have hyperpressure now the question comes in is what do we do are we going to take medication or are we going to change this because the people who are having high blood pressure that's not the only problem they are going to have they will develop high blood pressure they will develop diabetes they will have high cholesterol and few of us will be smoking you combine high blood pressure diabetes smoking and and uh, high cholesterol that's a recipe to have a heart attack and stroke so that's why when you're trying to correct for blood pressure you're not correcting it only your blood pressure you are changing as a whole and for, a, for us as a physician nothing is more important that once one of the patient comes in and said i have made lifestyle changes they have lost weight they have cut down the salt and their blood pressure is normal sugar is good it gives us a pleasure and we feel good stopping or cutting down your medications because that's the goal of healthcare is to improve quality of your life and make you live as long as humanly possible so staying on target how can you lower your blood pressure by 30 points just by lifestyle if you look at it if first is less before we get into treatment let's talk about the lifestyle and blood pressure how they are related and how they are linked because that will give you better insight let's start with diet remember in the plumbing analogy which i gave the blood the volume of the blood is controlled by the volume of water which is circulating in our body and what controls that volume is your kidney through salt and water retention if you eat processed or ultra processed food or foods high in salt what you are doing is you are telling your kidney to retain because body is a big tank if you put more sodium it has to retain more water so that the concentration of these electrolytes are balanced out so you take high salt next day your legs are swollen what is happening is your body through your kidneys is retaining water so first thing is your sodium has to go down at diet number 2 because that will decrease the volume number 2 is the diet when you eat a lot of fat and processed carbohydrates they lead to increased production of a lot of hormones but we will keep a discussion to insulin say for example people who are eating a lot of processed food their body is producing lot of insulin function of insulin is to push this sugar or the processed food the carbohydrate which you're eating into your cells so that it's burned for energy but unfortunately this has other things insulin is leading to the proliferation of the blood vessel in your channels or the arteries so that your blood vessel sizes in the the muscle is squeezing and the size is decreasing so what is happening is this process food is making your arteries shrink or they are becoming more muscular so the less blood goes in when the less blood goes in your hormonal and the endocrine system and the, your autonomic nervous system thinks there is a less of the blood so it starts the whole chemical cascade and you are which leads to more salt or water retention increasing catecholamines increasing heart rate heart has to pump harder so we are just with the diet which we so far two things we discuss salt leading to salt and water processed and ultra processed diet over the period of time through insulin through catecholamines through sympathetic parasympathetic parasympathetic and parasympathetic systems leading to a narrowing of your blood vessels and leading to high blood pressure now sleep sleep is a very active process people who don't sleep they do have high incidence of heart attacks strokes and all host host of complications and then they lead to increased fatigue and the chemical changes in the body which leads to high blood pressure then is our mental the managing your stress 
when you're agitated, the body can be in two states, three states. State of equanimity where everything is flowing beautifully and we are in sync. Or if you are agitated, frustrated, you're, you're in a sympathetic overdrive, which all the sympathetic hormones will make your heart muscle to pump fast and strong. So it's going to get fatigued after that thing. So that's why people who are stressed all the time, they have a high risk of having, uh, they stimulate their heart more, they have high risk of developing heart attack and stroke by increasing those chemicals in the blood. Next is managing your stress. If you manage your stress, what you're doing is you're decreasing your sympathetic tone. You are increasing your parasympathetic tone. Sympathetic tone is which is fight and flight. And parasympathetic is a rest and digest where your body is resting, repairing, digesting. All the good things in the body which we need happen through when the parasympathetic system is active. Now, let's talk about potassium-rich diets. Whatever sodium does, in general, potassium is worse goes in the opposite direction. So as I said, the, the foods which are high in sodium or so common salt, they will lead to retention of the soft water and high blood pressure. Foods which are high in potassium, they counteract the effect of sodium, they will decrease the blood pressure. And those the high sodium diets are spinach, banana, and whole host of it. That's a video in itself with if there is a demand for that, I will go over all the diets, only on the diets in one day. But as a concept, today we are talking about high sodium diet is the reason for blood pressure. We need to lower the blood pressure. We need to increase potassium. We need to have regular diet, not the process or ultra process diet. And there is a DASH diet, which you might have heard about that. It's, a, it's basically clean eating, meaning that through the DASH diet is that you are consuming a lot of fruits, vegetables, legumes, and very little meat. And you are and more closer to Mediterranean diet with less salt. And that is has been proven over and over to lower your blood pressure. So, lower your sodium, increase your potassium, then lose, don't eat processed and ultra-processed food. Then moving forward, sleep well, manage your stress. And then the last thing is exercise. Exercise has a lot of beneficial effects in lowering your blood pressure. What is recommended is 30 minutes, do anything. If you're not doing anything, just do anything. Just walk in the house, 30 minutes. And as you do it, build more. But the recommendations are 30 minutes, five times a week, minimal, but preferably seven days a week. So if you exercise, low sodium diet, foods rich in potassium, and you are managing your stats, you are sleeping well, and avoiding all processed food, you will be able to control your blood pressure and you will lower by 30, 40 points. And then coming back to original discussion, most of us have stage one or stage two hypertension, which 100% is manageable with the lifestyle. But the point here is, are you willing to do that part? Because biggest challenge which we have is that we, when somebody gets, even patients who get a heart attack, stroke, they come to us, they are very motivated, but within two to three weeks, they are back to their old habits. So I think what we need to do is we need to create rule of thumbs. If you give your body a daily choice, who wants to go for exercise? Very few people who want to go exercise. But if we develop a habit that when we're gonna wake up in our lifestyle, wherever it fits, that that dedicated time is for 30 minutes walk and 30 minute exercise. Then when we are going, going to the groceries, we must eliminate all those processed and ultra-processed food which are high in salt, fat, and, and sugar. So you eliminate that, and when you're buying the food, you buy the right kind of food, then that's what you will eat. And you don't, there is no extra willpower you need to do it, this thing is. So basically, when we talk about the lifestyle changes, it needs to lead to action, and which are part of your daily life. You cannot make decision. I have knowing what I know, 
I personally fail every day to make right choices if I have to make choices all the time. So basically what I have developed is I wake up, I go to gym six to seven every day. But then I, on the weekends, I will go for grocery shopping with my wife and we buy the things which needs to be done so that we could manage our health better. We are trying to manage our stress, have a work-life balance, and then be good human being and find meaning and purpose in your life, whatever work which we are doing. And medicine is very easy because we, medicine becomes your life and you will find love, joy, and everything in medicine. And that's what, in this stage of life, I am really blessed to take care of a lot of people who trust us and we are able to do that part. So lifestyle changes, these are the seven lifestyle changes which I've explained. If you are sincere and you do the following, exercise every day, sleep seven to eight hours, manage your steps, high potassium to food, low sodium diet, and manage the rest of the part and exercise, you can lower your blood pressure. And that will not only will control your blood pressure, that will also take care of your diabetes, cholesterol, and everything that's going on. Next question, which we usually get is that, what are the different kind of medications which we use for treatment of hypertension? I will, this video's purpose is to give you general guidelines and so that you could understand your medications where they work. So as we started with our plumbing analogy, let's start with our pump. There will be, when we are trying to lower your blood pressure, there will be medications which we could use to affect our pump, then the medications which we are can use, which are the pipes or the arteries or the arterioles, the artery real side, which we could do, the, which can affect that. So there will be blood medications targeted on the size of the blood vessels. And then the third target point is how much blood volume which is circulating in your, uh, in your blood. And then fourth is to managing specific sites in your kidneys uh, where we sense the volume part of it is. Then there are hormonal medications, which let's, uh, let's go over all of them so that you understand your medications. So let's first talk about pump. There are a lot of medications. The pump is the heart muscle does two things. Not only it pumps, it also fills and squeezes out. There is a class of medication which we call beta blockers. They decrease the heart rate. If you are relaxed, your heart rate goes down automatically. That's exactly these medications do. These medications, the, the normal pacemaker of your heart, it decreases the heart. They go there and decrease your heart rate. So your blood pressure is how many times your heart is pumping and how much is pumping out. That's what gives the blood pressure, uh, the, that's what determines how blood pressure is. So the beta blocker is the first class of medication which lowers the heart rate and then uh, it will lead to a lower heart rate and then the blood pressure goes down. Second class of medication is the muscle. There are lack of the medication which we call calcium channel blocker, which acts on heart muscle and on the muscle in your, in your arteries to relax them so that it's not squeezing too much into that. So that is the second target of this thing is called the calcium channel blocker. Then we all know the water pills, those diuretic, whether it's a hydrochlorothiazide or a Lasix or Bupitamide, all of them, they are basically trying to make your kidneys pee out so that the volume of the blood goes down. Next class, if we call, there are two classes, where they remember from the original discussion, our kidneys are the sensors of our volume, this one is. Here, in case of hypertension, our nature works against us, but there are two medications we call AC inhibitors and ARBs. There is a hormone which kidney produces, and that is the strongest hormone which leads to hyperpressure. So we have medication which target those medications which are which are stopping that production of that hormone uh, angiotensinogen so three so 
next target is this uh, kidneys other classes remember i told we talked about the one the sympathetic and parasympathetic there are older medications which are available which goes and work with most common which a few of you would be aware is clonidine which we used to use a lot because this is old medication that basically works through your blocking to your uh, your sympathetic system it it goes and does but then there are other medications which is called alpha blockers they also work on the blood vessel walls and relax them so putting it together there are medications which in your pump either through decreasing your heart rate or through the force of the muscle then there are two classes then the medication working on the muscles of your artery which we are try, trying to relax them so that the blood can flow go quickly then third target is the blood volume fourth is the kidneys there are two classes and then ancillary medications which are working through sympathetic and parasympathetic system and through other hormonal axes that's basically constitutes the main classes of uh, blood pressure medications now let's talk about side effects because the reason is lifestyle has no side effect it has everything to gain but now let's say all these medications whatever side it's a very easy to understand the side effect remember whatever the body this medication is doing to do one action it is going to lead to opposite reaction somewhere where it's going to lead to that if your heart rate is low you could you will be tired you will be feeling weak then if your heart muscle is not pumping but this one is feeling weak or blood vessel you will have leg swelling you may start retaining fluid again you will be short of breath and all those things so my goal in through this video is to make sure we few of us will need blood pressure medication but i truly believe if you are honest and if you implement lifestyle changes you will need very few medications very little side effects and for young guys all these medications have a lot of sexual side effects so life it works in tandem you you mess up one place a lot of other things go wrong and if you do lifestyle changes everything improve your full of vigor and your virility improve everything gets better so there are a lot of incentive to have develop a healthy lifestyle then we come to is what are the complications of hypertension as i said is the it could be when the blood pressure is high there is lot of shearing force the initially when this shearing force increases remember i gave you the analogy of taps different each organ has a safety valve like we could increase the flow in the tap we could decrease the flow the same way in our blood vessel there are receptors which kind of regulate whatever blood is coming through into our organs but how much they are going to go let it go inside that they all is called auto regulation and each organ system auto regulates it so when your blood pressure is going up initially your system is try to auto regulate so that it does not want the shearing force or the increased volume bombarding your organs but this auto regulation has a point after which it cannot keep up with that then they start giving up when they start giving up that is the time you start having your organs getting damaged let's go from head to toe the brain is the most important part so if your blood pressure is high especially after as you age if you have persistent hypertension your risk of stroke increases number 2 eyes blindness number 3 now there is a lot of studies which are coming in that you are dizziness with this is a very common symptom in the in primary care practices or ringing in the ear that can happen through high blood pressure heart attack number one of the four main classic risk factors to develop heart attack stroke is high blood pressure diabetes stroke and smoking three of them are related to lifestyle so heart attack congestive heart failure kidney failure leading to dialysis 
if you have block problem with the blockages in your leg arteries, the peripheral artery disease or PADs, amputations. So the list is endless. Name, pick any organ, hypertension will affect it. So if I'm asked, what are the complications of high blood pressure? Go from, start looking from head to toe, stroke, blindness, heart attack, heart failure, kidney failure, losing limbs, and multiple other things. So what is the next thing is, what is the personal cost of that, the blood pressure? In this, in the United States, as I said, it's about 47% of us have high blood pressure one way or the other. In worldwide, obesity is not as high as in what we have in the United States. But if we look at but almost 8 billion people living, 1.3 billion people are under medical treatment for hypertension. So it is a huge problem and it is coming from our prosperity. I think we are blessed to be born in the United States or being immigrant here, that this one is, because you don't get more what you get in the United States. I think if there is a heaven on the earth, it's probably pretty close to it, the, is being in the United States. We have knowledge, we have resources, we have technology. Where we are lacking is self-will and motivation. And I'm hoping through these videos, I will be able to generate some momentum where I could do a better job. One of the reasons we started this YouTube channel was because I repeat this discussion in a smaller format, probably 15 to 20 times a day. And just the thought come in that if I could put my thoughts together and as we go along, make it a formal way where a normal primary care physician and we bring the exam room out in public, where you could hear it out over and over this one is, probably this will help. And then the other part is in trying to prepare for these videos, I am also learning and growing with you. So it's a helping me more to prepare for this one, at least put my thoughts together as the part of it is. So all we all will grow together. So coming in with this uh, process, it is about 1.3 billion people are on this one, which has a huge financial burden. Then there are a few questions for how much uh, I, as we said in that we do conduct a survey in our, in our office regarding what are the questions we should tackle in this live sessions. They, people had questions around what is the best time they were best time to take the blood pressure i think any time is good to check blood pressure but i could explain you normal circadian rhythm of our body our blood pressure is highest at 9 a.m in the morning then it starts going down in normal person up till 12 a.m then from 12 a.m it start going there is a couple of millimeters of mercury fluctuation which happens so I truly believe if you want to, if you're check blood pressure anytime, but check your blood pressure around 9, 10 o'clock because that is the time physiologically supposed to be highest. And if your blood pressure is normal at that time, then the chances are it is normal. So I think the question, answer to that question is check anytime, but 9, 10 o'clock is probably the best. Then the second question which I had from my patient was, she was getting, her left arm blood pressure was high and the right arm blood pressure was low. That is a problem. That patient had a section. And if you are getting different readings, which are varying widely, you must call, go to your physician quickly and you should, you should get attention. You should, that all the time, it doesn't mean bad, but in my patient had dissection, so you make sure you take care of yourself and you let them know. Then the next question which I've been, what is the best cough to buy? I think 
the calf size should be big enough that it fits your uh, your muscle and then i personally my liking is for the automated one and which takes three readings because they are ai powered and they do not allow they take the all the confabulations out or the errors which we could do while taking it it comes in here you just hold it here at the level of heart and do this one but any blood pressure machine will be okay and if you have getting very fluctuating readings then you should go to your uh, and take your blood pressure record it take your machine your doctor's office and they can check blood pressure there uh, with their instruments and your instrument and you could find it out whether that instrument instrument is calibrated or is not calibrated then is the i was asked a question whether intermittent fasting will lower the blood pressure i truly believe it will because uh, once you are skipping meals let's forget about the science behind it or anything just let's stick to the number of calories i have done this exercise many times when you sit down to eat whatever the combination and concoctions we come in our average meal becomes about 700 calories even if say for example you skip one meal you are technically consuming less calories so it is a you no know, any kind of diet you ever go eventually it is a low calorie diet you can even on atkins and keto diet and all those things in the end they are basically eliminating the unwanted calories which you are consuming and your number of calories go down and you get all the good effects in addition to some particular part of it is then i was asked a question why our afro american population have high incidence of blood pressure i think that's a video topic in itself in celebration of black history month we will be producing about series of 15 videos in the coming month of february where we will take up this topic which is particular to our uh, afro american population what are the things they could do what are the things which makes their medical conditions unique and complicated so we will be going over with them but yes they have a higher rate of high blood pressure and especially in the worrying some part is in younger people and their body is genetically more predisposed to have a higher risk of complication with same blood pressure reading based on their counterparts which we will explore in the upcoming videos then the blood pressure in elderly is very important see remember which i when i was explaining you the treatment guidelines gnc recognizes that if we become super aggressive in lowering blood pressure in elderly and very elderly population what we do is we increase the risk of side effect complication and especially falling and that can be very cumbersome so as we are recording this video and live session the blood pressure reading which is accepted at 60 and above is target goal is 140 over 90 in younger people it's a very different and diabetics and if you already have a heart attack and stroke it is a very different game so next question what what is pri- what is primary hypertension and what is secondary hypertension primary hypertension is like there are certain changes which happen in our body as we age which are primarily hardening up your artery your elastic content in your blood vessel so when the blood is passing through that the resistance which is faces through that it is increasing that happen aging is in itself is a disease and there is no cure for it but this is a blessing to get age so certain things will happen to this body as we age at its own speed so that will lead to a little bit of high blood pressure with aging but once the blood pressure start increasing due to other reasons like when we ex- there is some normal loss of elasticity and increased muscle but once we start developing plaques and having all those other and then the hormonal and endocrine problem that leads to another multiple complications that is a different story and that we call secondary hypertension but 
for all practical purposes unless you are very young which your physician will pick it up and if you are requiring more than four three medications think that you may have some other reason you may not have a normal a regular high blood pressure there might be some reason for your high blood pressure the message is if you are requiring more than three pills to control your blood pressure that could be secondary hypertension and we will uh, you should let your physicians know then the question comes over and over about the salt some people are very some people are very sensitive to salt if once they lose lower their salt their blood pressure goes away to the point that they digs they don't require any medication so salt is a major thing so let's recapitulate in conclusion what i wanted to convey the message through this live session was number 1 blood pressure in my words stage 1 and stage 2 is a preventable disease or at least we could delay it as long as possible so long as we follow good lifestyle and that lifestyle is exercising sleeping managing stress diet rich in potassium rich foods diet rich uh, lower in your processed ultra processed and the sodium diet and just making your daily routines so that this is not a special act which you have to do that then we went over the plumbing analogy how this each system works then we went over the medication side effects then we discussed about different kind of uh, complications which can rise and how the blood pressure affects your body what is primary hypertension what is secondary hypertension and how it puts you at high risk for heart attack stroke kidney failure and blindness i am hoping that you will get something out of this video i truly enjoy talking to you through this videos and rest of the month of february will be created to honor black history month we will be creating videos and go through different sessions regarding the problem which are unique to our afro patron population thank you very much have a good day let's change our lifestyle and let's control our blood pressure thank you very much be peace